Hello, everybody, and welcome to San Francisco's hospital in Münster, Germany. My name is Giovanni Torsello. I am the chief of the Department of Vascular Surgery in Münster, and I have my host, Dr. Steinmetz, from the University of Bourgogne in Dijon. It's a big pleasure to welcome you to the, this webcast on the use of the, of the TX2 stent graft for repair of thoracic aortic aneurysm. During the next hour, we want to cover the background technique for endovascular repair of aneurysm of the descending aorta. You can send your questions anytime by clicking the M direct access button. To introduce now our host, I would like to ask him to make a, a device description. Dr. Steinmetz, please. Thank you, Dr. Tozello. Thank you for, for being here. Thank you for hosting me. It's really a pleasure and an honor for me to be here in Münster. So I am going to introduce the device, the TX2 device, thoracic device. You know it's a modular one, usually two pieces. First, we'll focus on the proximal piece. The proximal piece is made, as you can see here, with a woven dacron and uh, Z-stent that are sewn, some inner, some outer, the, the fabric. You can see it's well flexible. The, the proximal component has a closed a stand at the top. This closed stand has some hooks, as you can see here, very tiny little hooks. And what you can see is that they are oriented codally. They are oriented codally in order to prevent uh, a movement downstream. So uh, that's uh, the, the proximal part. And you see that there is another part, a distal part. This one is so a little bit different than the proximal one you can see here. You can see that the distal one has an open stand at the end. This open stand has as well some hooks, but you can see that these hooks are oriented cranially in order to prevent a shrinkage down. Uh, uh, backstream, I'm sorry. So what is very important when you use a modular device is to bring the distal device inside the proximal one and to make sure the overlapping is at least three to four stand. So now we will switch to a short animation that will show you those two comp components and more details about that. Here on screen, you can see a, a thoracic aneurysm with a proximal neck, a distal neck. You can see the wire. You can see the very nice sheath that comes along the proximal uh, part that it's launched. You can see the, 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 the top of the, uh, the device is protected. Then is secondary, is it's launched, and the hooks are uh, fixing the proximal device into the aortic wall. Then the, the uh, um, distal device comes in with a uh, nice overlapping, as you can see, and the, uh, the distal part. Well, so uh, now we will focus on the, the sheath. That's really the progress of that TX2 graft. This sheath is very interesting because of four and f maybe five points. First one is the tip. As you can see, the tip is very tapered, very soft, it's smooth, it comes all along the wire, and it's shaped as a dilator. Then you have the uh, hydrophilic coated uh, flexible sheath. That flexible sheath is so flexible that you can come all along very, very tiny tortuosity, as you can see here. And the hydrophilic, the hydrophilic uh, fabric that is around the sheath allows the, the device to come inside the aorta, but as well to come outside without tearing or disturbing the iliac artery that it's really, really an issue. 
Here you have uh, the two other points. Here is the, the, the guide wire uh, control that is here. And there is also a, a nitinol cannula, you can see here, very flexible. And that nitinol comes all along the guide wire to the top and permits this flexible device to come into very, very tortuous situation. Now I will show you how, it's, uh, how you can launch it. It's wet, so it's very difficult. It's much more difficult that, than in the real life. But you can see here that it's easy to launch. You can see as well that it's protected at the top. This threefold protection that is guided by the, uh, the, the control here allows the bloodstream to come around the, the processes. Okay. And so it's pretty easy in a second time to, uh, to move better uh, backwards than downwards because of the hook, but to move and, and come very precisely at the point you want to, to, uh, to launch the device. Now we will see an animation on the screen that will show you what we were speaking about. You can see the sheath, you can see the threefold proximal component, you can see the uh, nitinol cannula that allows the sheath to be so flexible. It's really trackable. Here you can see the tip, the tip that is so soft, so smooth. It's shaped like a dilator and it helps to come in some tiny uh, iliac situations. Here is the, the nitinol. Here you can see how you can, you can bend the, uh, the sheath. Here is the, uh, the, it's a kind of, of, uh, of tapered rod that it is inside the sheath. Okay, now we will speak about uh, preparation. Uh, I think it's time for introducing the case, Dr. Tosselo. Yes, thank today, you please. for the description of this device. And uh, we can demonstrate the features of this uh, special device in one case treated at our department uh, of vascular surgery in Münster. Um, we, uh, one 69-year-old uh, male patient came to our hospital with back and abdominal pain. And uh, the CT scan demonstrated an aneurysm of the descending thoracic aorta with a tortuosity of both iliacs. We planned to perform an angiovascular exclusion of the aneurysm and uh, before we made some measurements, the next slide can show you the 3D reconstruction of the CT scan. You see we have uh, a good uh, proximal neck, we have the huge aneurysm, but we have also a severe tortuosity of both external iliac artery and of the left common iliac artery. So uh, it is uh, sure a demanding case um, for endovascular repair. Um, this slide shows also the, the diameter of the proximal neck, 36 millimeters, and of the distal, 34 millimeters. And uh, on the basis of the preoperative pre angiography, please show the next slide, you can see also the length of the aneurysm, which was uh, 234 millimeters. In this case, we decided to use a zenith graft with a proximal component of 40 millimeters in diameter and uh, 20 centimeters length, and a distal component with 38 millimeters in diameter and uh, 186 millimeters in length. Please, next. So we decided to use this because of the spe special features of this graft. And I would like to demonstrate the implantation uh, through a video. Perhaps we can see the video now. In, at our department, we use the percutaneous technique. We, um, we use the pre-closing technique. That means that uh, after um, at, um, after we introduce the sheet, 
we um, perform the endovascular suture with the, with the per close, which is a catheter that contains four sutured uh, needles. You see the, uh, the per close advancing through the iliacs and through the abdominal aorta. And now we uh, left, um, we leave the suture uh, untied and we go on with the implantation of the graft. Always we use uh, uh, a stiff wire. In this case, a double curved uh, Landerquist wire, which was introduced through an angiographic catheter. So now we have to prepare the, um, the stand craft. You see now the Landerquist wire going up, up to the ascending aorta. We remove the angiographic catheter and to, for angiographic control we use in this case uh, inguinal approach through the left groin. Now we prepare the proximal component, component. We have to remove the stylet from the tip of the inner cannula and the cannula protector tube. And then we have to remove the peel away sheet from the back of the valve assembly. We attach a syringe with the saline to the hub of the inner cannula. And we flush until fluid exits the distal side parts of the, uh, and the dilator tips. We elevate the distal tip of the system and flush through the hemostatic valve until fluid emerges from the tip of the introduction sheet. We discontinue the injection and uh, close the stop cock on the connecting tube. I think that's a very important point because you have really to de-air all the sheaths during that, that procedure because as we, we are working in the upper part of the body, it's really a problem if some air comes into the carotid arteries, for, for example. So it's very, very important to flush and de-air all, uh, all along the, the sheath. Yeah. Perhaps you have appreciated the flexibility of the inner cannula and uh, of the sheath itself. Yeah. And now you can see how easy it is I, to I'm advance really, the sheet. I'm really amazed by, the, by your case because the iliac arteries, are, as you can see, are very, very tortuous. Yeah. And that uh, type of hydrophilic coated sheet is really, really a progress. And I don't think that type of cases could be made with previously uh, type of devices. Yeah, now you see the graft advancing through the thoracic aorta up to the arch. And now we can deploy the graft, stabilizing the gray positioner, the shaft of the system, and withdrawing the sheet until the graft is fully expanded. Of course, we perform an angiography so we don't have to cover the left subclavian artery. Uh, perhaps you can appreciate now the, the deployment of the proximal component, which is really easy to do. And the word that it is inside the sheath that prevents the, uh, the, the it prevents the downstream migration, migration of, the, yes. of the, the device. That's very important as well. 
Now we have to loosen the safety lock from the green trigger wire release mechanism. And we draw the trigger wire slowly until the proximal end of the graft opens. I think that's an important point as well because if you, uh, as, as long as the, 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 the process is, in, is not launched uh, in its entire position, uh, there is no risk of, of migration because of that threefold uh, wire control. You have probably seen also the release of the proximal and the distal attachment of the introducer. Here is the preparation of the, of the, the distal, distal part. Yes. It's uh, in the same way, no difference at all. So, so wha yes. what's, once again, it's very important to, to flush the old, uh, the old device. It's uh, the hydrophilic coating ar around the, the sheath must be really soaked. It must be wet always wet because if it's if it's dry it can it can uh, that can be dangerous so it has to be wet wet while uh, progressing inside the iliac artery so you see now we advanced the distal component we retracted the pigtail the first big uh, angiography was made outside the graft and perhaps you can see the different intercostal arteries which uh, will be excluded by the graft. Now the normal angiography to identify the cilia trunk. And now you can see the advancement of the distal component. As uh, you mentioned, it's very, very important to have enough overlapping. How much overlapping do you use I in France? We, we, we are actually we, lap, we overlap as long as possible. The, I, I think the, personally think the ideal length of the overlapping is the length of the aneurysm. But it should not be less than three stents. Yes. Now you see the exact deployment. The, the way is similar as the proximal. You see okay. now the deployment of the last stents and now we have to release the distal attachment by first unscrewing the trigger wire safety lock and then withdrawing and removing the wire trigger wire release mechanism labeled with the number one so it's easy to identify the first one because the, 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 the trigger wire point. are labeled with numbers you see the number one Actually, I cannot show you a, a, a distal part, but imagine for the distal part, you have two different wire control, number one and number two, so it's very important to, to unlock the first one and then the number two. Yes, and now we, uh, the next step will be to unscrew and remove the safety lock of the telescopic handle labeled with the number two. We stabilize the delivery system and slide the telescopic handle together with the gray tube and the outer sheet until the distal attachment stand is uh, completely released. What is very interesting is that you can, at the very last moment, you can check and make sure that you don't cover the ostium of the, of the celiac trunk or the branch you ever wanted to, to spare. And that's very, very important. So now you can precise. see we are loosening the safety lock from the green trigger wire release mechanism. And we draw the trigger wire number three until the proximal end of the graft completely opens. And that's it. Good job. <laughs> we have now uh, to perform a completion angiogram. You see it okay. with the complete exclusion of the big aneurysm without endoleak. And uh, in this case, we don't use, uh, we haven't used any molding balloon, but perhaps we can discuss about later on. You now can see the, the suture of the um, uh, 
uh, of upper close sutures. I'm they I'm are then tied with a sliding knot and we use the fisherman uh, knot technique. And uh, after fastening of the sutures, we use a knot pusher. This is the second knot. You see the delivery system is uh, uh, already in place. It's and very interesting because I, I, I never did this technique. I'm a little bit old fashioned and I'm always cutting off, but yes. it's, it seems to be very, very interesting. You see, the, we have removed the sheet now and we are fastening the sutures and uh, the field is almost dry. It's not completely dry because we have the, the wire uh, still in place. But now we can remove the wire and uh, the knot pusher can be used to push the knot to the arterial wall. Uh, I would like to mention that we use a 22 French introducer sheet in this case, so, but we have also experience with 24 and 25 French introducers. You see the, the, the field is completely dry. We cut the sutures uh, below the level of the skin and uh, with one suture we close the, um, the puncture site. What do you think about this case? I think that's a very, very nice case. It's a tough case, actually, because, uh, as said previously, the iliac artery tortus, you can see that the upper neck is not that long. It's very, very curved tortus. And uh, I think uh, the device must be very good to, uh, to come all along these difficulties. Uh, but I think the, the immediate result is very, very interesting and I'm pretty sure we will have a lot of questions concerning yes, uh, this yes. case. And we have still questions and uh, let's go to the email questions that we have received. Meanwhile, we, we start with the first one. Uh, you have seen we, we performed a preoperative angiogram. Is it really necessary, mandatory to do it in this case? What do you well, think? Well, I, I would say probably in this case, yes. I think it's, it, it is mandatory because uh, the case was difficult, iliac rod tortus, the, and I think uh, we have to focus on the proximal neck. That's really the key point in this case because you have seen that the, uh, the aortic arch was really tortuous with a, with a big angulation, and uh, even with uh, CT reconstruction, it's, it's a little bit difficult to... Uh, to assess the real length of the, the neck. Should we or should we not cover the left sub subclavian artery? It's always an issue and I think it's a real elegant way to do, uh, to planning not to cover it and so it's, it's always possible to cover it in case we have a type 1 endonic. And I think probably, so in this case, I would say yes, uh, angiography was probably mandatory. But, you know, the CT reconstruction are improving well and probably that in the, in the next year, uh, angiography w will become obsolete. Another point that we should raise is that a uh, uh, number of these patients are, have a renal function that is, is very bad. So uh, performing a pre-op angio plus a CT comes to a, a high level of contrast and that's really an issue. So what we, we, we usually do is uh, trying to avoid the pre-op angiography and start with an angio during the operation. But uh, the consequence of that is that we usually have to order different size of grafts so we can choose the one off the shelf, the, one, the best one depending on what showed the, the per operative angiography. Do How you much uh, contrast media um, do we need usually for this um, endovascular? Well, material? actually, we, we have a, a, li a little a kind of special technique because we dil d dilute uh, our contrast media half and half with saline. So that allows us to use double uh, quantity of contrast and uh, our average contrast is 55 cc per procedure. That means in some, some, in some cases we can do them with, with 2 times 20 and uh, in some cases we, we did much more. But uh, 55 
that's my average over 200 cases, uh, triple A and, and, uh, and uh, thoracic. Perfect. Yes. And uh, what about, uh, do, do you mentioned the covering of the left subclavian artery. Perhaps uh, can preoperative angiography help to, to know something more about intracerebral um, circulation and compensatory ways in case of... Uh, to, to avoid paraplegia, you yeah. mean, yes. That's but also to avoid stroke. Oh, to avoid stroke uh, as well. Well, actually, my, my experience in uh, thoracic is not big enough, so m my knowledge is much more, relies much more on the literature than on my, because I, I only did 28 cases on thoracic, so, uh, well, but I th I'm pretty sure it's, it's something we have to count off. And uh, wh what's your, your position about that? Well, my problem? position is in case, uh, if we have very difficult anatomies and we are not sure if we can leave the, the subclavian artery open, we, we uh, make an angiography to see in, uh, the possibility of uh, intracranial um, circulation. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important. Otherwise, we can um, perform a subclavian carotid transposition first and then repair of the aneurysm. Actually, I, my, our policy was not to perform this type of bypass or transposition on purpose. And yeah. we, we reserve it to the patient who had uh, ischemia, chronic ischemia of the lower limb. But uh, I agree with you. And I, I, two of my patients had strokes. And maybe in one case, that was, it was possibly due to a, a, a coverage yeah. of the... Yeah. the of the subclavian, but I think when we want to treat uh, the uh, uh, thoracic aneurysm, uh, we have to take the risk of covering the subclavian when the neck is too short, because the risk of an open operation is in that in our type of patient, in the real life type of patient, is is very very big. So I prefer to to take the risk of covering the subclavian, the left subclavian in order to make sure I have no type 1 endolic. But I agree with you, uh, b both points can be defended. Yeah. Uh, I have one more interesting question. Do you routinely slow or stop the heart to implant one of these grafts? Is it necessary? Now? Well, th that's, that's an important question as well. But what we can say is that with this new device, the TX2, it's, it's much less useful than it used to be. I mean, uh, with, with uh, uh, I think, older device, uh, the, the risk of m uh, downstream migration was very, very important. So it was necessary to, to lower the blood pressure, to lower the, the heart beating. And uh, so I'm not sure that with this device it will be uh, uh, mandatory. But it's, it's certain that if we, if we speak from debranching, uh, uh, debranching the carotid arteries in order to fix, for example, uh, arch uh, aortic aneurysm, uh, in that case, even with the TX2, we will probably have to, uh, to, to, to do that type of, of, uh, of uh, handling to, to, to make sure that mm -hmm. there is no risk of migration. What, what is your position about well, that? Well, I agree completely. At the beginning of our experience, we, we stopped the heartbeat with using adenosine. But uh, with the, this uh, device, we have uh, absolute control of the position of the device. So I, we, we don't see any, any need uh, more to use it. And uh, we don't like to pace the heart, you know. There is another method to do it by pacing and induction of uh, um, arrhythm arrhythmia for positioning. So we, we have the same uh, strategy using uh, lowering of the blood pressure. And, and uh, we, are, we are more than happy to use this, uh, this, this graft in these cases, which allow an exact positioning of the graft. We have uh, one more question. How do you size the grafts you use? Uh, well, uh, usually I, I try to uh, avoid doing angiography and I only use uh, CT. Yes. 
if possible with reconstruction, of course, and I try not to oversize too much. Uh, I saw you, you, your case was had a 36 centimeter right. diameter and you choose a, a 40. A 40, which is not uh, a huge oversizing, but I, I totally agree with you. I think that if we speak about open surgery, when we open on thoracic aorta, we sometimes use 30 and or maximum 32 uh, diameter prosthesis that we sew on. So why, uh, when we work endovascularly, should we work and oversize that on that way. It's, uh, I, I make a parallel with the triple A's. Uh, if you fix a triple A uh, open, a triple A, you will use probably a maximum 22 centimeters. And if you, uh, if you treat it uh, endovascularly, you will choose a 28, sometimes 32. So I'm pretty sure the, the, the measurement, the precision of measurement is probably not as good as the CT seems to be. But that's on m more philosophical point of view, yes. I mean. But I, I totally agree with you not to oversize too much the... Uh, the, the but legs. at least should be 15%, uh, I think. In case of aneurysm, it's different if we treat a dissection. In case of dissection, we shouldn't oversize too much to the graft, otherwise we can provoke um, uh, the dissection type A. So sure. uh, oversizing sure. dissection cases uh, should even be less. avoided. Even less. Sure. Uh, avoid. sure. Sure. Okay. Uh, I have one more question about the approach, transbrachial approach. In this case, we use a transinguinal, transfemoral approach also for the angiography. In which case, we should recommend the use of a transbrachial approach? Well, or, or the left or, <laughs> or the right. <laughs> we have to decide uh, also about I, this. I personally choose the, the, uh, the right side approach because of the position I have around the patient. I have usually the screen at the left side of the patient and the scrub team is uh, at the right side of That's the patient. Your for your comfort. Also. Exactly, it's for my comfort, but uh, well, it's as well because I'm working in a very small operating room, so it's for, for some other reason, but one point is it's possible to do like that. So when I'm working on the, the very uh, upper part of the thoracic aorta, uh, I usually uh, put bring, um, um, bring um, a catheter from the, the brachial, or the right brachial, into the ascending aorta and uh, put a pigtail on that position and do all my injections when I need several injections from that point. The reason is that you, 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 you can uh, always uh, use, um, you can always perform an angiography whenever you have a problem. You know, so, but I agree with you. I take uh, probably more risk than uh, coming out from the left side because of the right carotid. Mm -hmm. I have one more question. Um, the doctor asks why we use two graphs and not one only. For example, in case of, uh, of um, a small aneurysm, small, I mean, uh, the length is not so big. Why two? Why uh, proximal and distal? Well, I think probably for small aneurysm, it's, it's reasonable to, to use a, a one-piece a one piece endograph. But uh, uh, the real life showed us that usually patients have a long, big aneurysm. And in, in that uh, setting, I think it's probably safer for long-term uh, uh, safety to, uh, to put a modular one because you can overlap as long as you want and you can hook uh, very precisely at the upper part and at the, at the end. And sometimes the aorta is so tortuous, you cannot uh, previously, uh, previously know how, well, at the time you put a, you put a Lundquist in, sometimes it shrinks, sometimes mm. it keeps very, very, with a very, very large curvature. So if you uh, measure the, the aneurysm length, you never know before 
how long it will be. So it's easier to come out with a, a two pieces modular graph than a, with a one piece. What's your experience with the one one piece uh, graph? Well, for short aneurysm, is so with the one, one piece if we have, uh, uh, if we can cover the the lesion with the 16 millimeters, uh, uh, sorry, 16 centimeters, of course. Uh, stand graph, we, we can use one, otherwise we have to use two. Uh, because we, uh, uh, before we go on with the, with the next question, perhaps we can discuss about the demographics uh, points, or, uh, points of view of this uh, disease. Um, because thoracic chaotic aneurysm um, is, is very frequent, 25% uh, of all aortic aneurysm and 20,000 to 25,000 patients are diagnosed annually with um, uh, a thora thoracic aortic aneurysm in the Western countries. So it's uh, a very big problem. What do you think? Oh, yeah, sure. But for some reason, and I don't know exactly why, in my experience, I have many more uh, AAA than thoracic. So uh, I, I I've heard, I've read those uh, data, but, uh, well, you know, I, I, it's, it's like if in Burgundy people wouldn't have uh, a lot of thoracic aneurysm and had many more triple eight. Well, what is the, pro 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 what is the proportion uh, in your patient between thoracic and triple eight? Oh, well, um, almost 20%. 20%. 20%. Okay. And the difference between um, triple A's and thoracic is that uh, the most patients with triple A are male, and the, the thoracic, we have uh, a lot of female. Okay. So the relationship between male and female and thoracics uh, is, in our experience, three to one, two to one. Uh, which are the advantages of the endovascular repair? So, well, avoid morbidity of large chest incision. Of, of course, uh, speaking about thoracotomy in these cases, we, we all have the experience of large centers who are, are used to, uh, to operate on open patient, but we know that in our experience, in the real life experience, the results are not probably are not as good as they are in uh, in these uh, big series. So I think it's really really an asset, and it's it's very an, very interesting tool, being able to avoid to open yeah. the chest of, and and besides that, patients are uh, have more and more comorbidities, and uh, in that setting, it's in this patient, it's the question is not open or endovascular; it's rather endovascular or nothing. That's yeah, the point. Yeah, yeah. The, I, I mean, the case presentation was uh, very impressive. You can imagine that, the, um, after, especially after percutaneous uh, approach, the patient can go home very, very quickly. The hospital stay is uh, shorter. The recovery is uh, very quick. So it's a real uh, big advantage of this, um, um, of this technique um, compared with the open procedure. Okay. Another point is uh, to avoid the cardiopulmonary bypass. That's, yes, a, that's another qu critical point because we know it has its own morbidity. And we know that with endovascular endograft, usually uh, the, the risk of paraplegia is, is not null. We know that. We, if we do a lot of cases, we will have, a lot of, we will have some paraplegia, but it's probably less than that it could be with, with yeah. open procedures. I wonder why. Maybe because we don't have idea? to clip any, any uh, side branches. Maybe because of the output, the cardiac output keeps, uh, keeps uh, regular during the whole operation. Uh, uh, the, less the inflammation the maybe the as the well. Hemodynamic uh, stability, stability is, yes, sure, uh, is very sure, important, I think, sure. for, um, for circulation of... Um, uh, okay. Um, we should go on now with the next question. Um, do you recommend ballooning with the grafts as a, uh, a last step of the procedure? Well, actually, a ballooning, uh, molding with the balloon, not, not, not dilating, okay, well, molding can be something helpful, but um, I, do, I don't do that. Uh, I don't do that uh, on, the, on each procedure. It really depends when the neck is, is nice, when the overlapping is nice, when the distal neck is nice as well. 
I don't, I don't balloon uh, and, uh, on the, uh, every time. But in this case, do you think you should have? Probably not, because you did no, not no. do it, and you don't regret to not have. Well, we uh, we perform ballooning only uh, if the patient, sh uh, uh, or the angiography, the completion angiography shows endolic type one, only in this case. Otherwise, we don't recommend to do it. And um, uh, once, many years ago, I I saw also a migration of a graft during this procedure. So. I have to put a cuff to to treat this um, endolic type one was uh, which was caused by the doctor, you know. <laughs> okay. Um, the paraplegia was another question from the audience. Um, another question is: Do you use the same graft also for dissection of the aorta? Well, my, my experience on dissection is very, very small, and uh, well, so I, I can only speak about what, what what is written in the literature. So I well, what I would do is to to oversize as less as possible, and uh, the problem is, I th to my mind, is for dissection is more to know what are the real indications because we know that the, the last report of the Iowa registry and so on, uh, it was not, not very positive for the, uh, the endografting of, of, uh, of, uh, the, of dissection, but we know it's sometimes very, very interesting. It's, it's, it's helpful. The problem is to know how, what we should, we treat, how should we treat uh, asymptomatic patients? Should mm -hmm. we do, treat them? Well, that's an open question, and we have so many studies going. One is uh, completed, the other has been started, and I think we have to wait for the results, not only af uh, after um, a few months, but also, uh, you know, after some years, sure. and see if uh, the patients uh, who didn't have uh, any treatment develop um, an aneurysm um, after the dissection, you know. So another question is, what is your anticoagulation regimen during and uh, after the procedure? Well, uh, we, we personally uh, had some problems at the beginning of our experience with the thrombosis inside those big sheets. Probably not in, the, in this one, but in the first generation. But the problem is we usually uh, uh, use uh, 50 units per kilogram of heparin for each vascular intervention. So that's what we used to, 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 to use at the beginning. And as we, we observed that... Um, that thrombus, uh, we, we switched to a hun 100 per kilogram, and uh, with that, for, for now, we had no problems. And we don't control it at the end. We, we just leave it like that and uh, bring, the, uh, uh, bring the patient on heparin for some days and then stop it okay. until he so works. That's uh, our strategy, too, and we don't need uh, any, uh, um, any anticoagulation after this no, treatment no, no. at all. Those big roads, those big, uh, big vessels don't need any yeah, anticoagulation. Usually not, and uh, I haven't seen um, a thrombosis also a big graft in mm. my life. Perhaps the last question, do you recommend any accessory or support items that help the procedure go smoothly wires or the other te techniques? Well, I, I think probably the, the, new, the new double curvature landocris is probably an asset as well, yes. Uh, well, uh, the landocris is really the hardest, uh, uh, the hardest uh, stuff wire you, you can have on the market. And with that double curvature, it's really, really, uh, it comes really gentle all along the aorta, goes into the arch and stays there. And I think that's, that's really something that is can be useful. Did you have an experience with the double curvature? Oh yes, I use always um, this wire and I am very, very happy to, to use it for also in case, especially in cases with the tortuosity. Mm -hmm. um, some years ago we had uh, problems uh, advancing uh, the graft through the iliacs and also in one case um, at the level of the arch. 
And so in this case, we uh, used the through and through uh, approach, means the, your approach, you know, through the for, right for the pressure, right breaker, yeah. Pressure, yeah. and then we catch the wire, and uh, in this way, it's possible to advance um, a stand craft which uh, cannot do it in, uh, uh, without this maneuver. Um, only in one case we had problems because the, the iliac vessels were not only elongated but also very, very calcified and in this case it was not possible to, to advance the graft, otherwise we had uh, always success. And, uh, we can also avoid the rupture of the, of the iliacs. There was one point with a through and through uh, wire. We have to be very, very careful not to tear the, the takeoff of the, of the, um, the subclavian or of the brachycephalic trunk. So I, I would recommend never to put the, the guide, the nude guide or the bare guide at that point because if you, if you pull on both sides of the guide, you can easily tear the, the aortic arch oh, yeah. at that moment and that can be can be very, very harmful for the patient. So it has to keep inside uh, another sh a specific sheath mm -hmm. or inside uh, a pigtail. Yeah. Okay, I think. Okay, uh, I have uh, just the last question to, uh, for me <laughs> because uh, it's about the percutaneous technique, which are the advantages of, uh, of this percutaneous technique. Well, it's more comfortable for the doctor because uh, the mm, operation time is reduced, but also for the patient, because uh, the patient is allowed to, uh, to leave the bed after a few hours and go home quickly. And we can reduce also the wound complications like seroma or peripheral nerve damage. And uh, perhaps the last advantage is uh, especially for AAA cases, sometimes we have uh, to perform secondary procedures. So it's much better to perform it in a groin without a scar. Exactly. Than what what, what about scar. the weight of stenosis, remaining stenosis? Did, did you oh, have no, it's some? very, very, very low. Okay. It's very and low. Uh, do you have to, to use US to, to, uh, to, see, to look for calcifications? Or of course. That's a very good point. So we perform a duplex scan or we, we, we see the CT scan of the groin before we decide. But uh, usually um, we don't exclude patients with calcification. Okay. If the calcification are on the back wall, okay. if they are on the front, we, we may cut down. But it is very, very seldom. And, uh, we treat also obese patients. That's, uh, in, no. in our experience, not a contraindication. The but only contraindication is uh, the short learning curve of the surgeon, you know, because you have uh, to know exactly what you do with this device to avoid disasters. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, we don't have any question, question. any more questions, so that um, I would like to close with the webcast. I would like to thank you thank for you. your thank you great for com me. contributions. And uh, I would like to thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.